Pakistan, and good morning to those joining from the United States and elsewhere. Uh, my name is Aaron Tiffany, and I'm an economic officer at the U.S. Embassy in Islamabad, and I've focused primarily on Pakistan's information and communication technology and cybersecurity policy and regulations. Uh, we're excited to have so many participants join this discussion and contribute to what I hope will be a constructive dialogue. I want to give special thanks to our partners at the American Institute of Pakistani Studies uh, and to my colleagues at the Public Affairs section here at the U.S. Embassy for organizing this event. Uh, Daniel, I look forward to your talk and to our Q&A afterwards to dive deeper on how Pakistan's government, civil society, and both its domestic and foreign industry stakeholders can work together to realize the economic value of internet freedom. Uh, and with that, I'd like to turn it over to Lynette Franco from our Public Affairs section, who will introduce tonight's speaker. Good evening, everyone. Thank you for joining us this evening on our latest installment of our policy speaker series here through the Public Affairs section of the U.S. Embassy Islamabad. I would also like to thank our partner, the American Institute of Pakistani Studies, for collaborating with us this evening. Tonight, we will focus on internet freedom and consider the importance of promoting internet freedom. As citizens and netizens, it's important to consider how data flows, internet penetration during normal times and during times of crisis, as well as how our use of the internet or non-use impacts our daily lives. We should also consider the policy implications and approaches to internet governance and internet freedom, what it means and its value. Our speaker this evening is Mr. Daniel Castro, and he will be presenting on the economic value of internet freedom. Mr. Castro is the Vice President of the Information Technology and Innovation Foundation, ITIF, and Director of ITIF's Center for Data Innovation. ITIF's mission is to formulate, evaluate, and promote policy solutions that accelerate innovation and boost productivity to spur growth, opportunity, and progress, as well as provide policymakers around the world with high quality information and analysis. Mr. Castro has a BS in Foreign Service from Georgetown University and an MS in Information Security Technology from Carnegie Mellon University. He writes and speaks on a variety of issues related to information technology and internet policy, including privacy, security, internet governance, and e-government. In 2015, he was appointed by the US Secretary of Commerce to the Commerce Data Advisory Council and previously worked for the Government Accountability Office as an IT analyst. I would like to remind our participants to please use the chat box to ask your questions throughout Mr. Castro's presentations that we can ask him in our Q&A portion. We are really fortunate to have a tech policy leader with us this evening. You can also follow Mr. Castro on Twitter at, at Castro Tech, where he identifies as a data enthusiast and a champion of inclusive innovation. Welcome, Daniel. Th Daniel, thank you so much for joining us and take it away. Thanks so much, Lynette. Um, and I appreciate the invitation to be here today and um, share with you some of my thoughts about uh, internet freedom and especially the economic value of, uh, of internet freedom. Uh, I really appreciate the opportunity to um, have this conversation and, and to get feedback and, and you know uh, push the dialogue forward in this important space. So um, as uh, Lynette mentioned, um, my name is Daniel Castro. I'm with a think tank called the Information Technology and Innovation Foundation. And ITIF really focuses on the intersection of technology, innovation, and public policy. And you know, as we emerge from this global pandemic, it's clearer um, than ever that digital innovation is a key driver of economic security. And what we've seen is that in a globally connected economy, access to internet is what enables digital trade, it enables so many uh, online services that people have come to depend on uh, from e-commerce to health to uh, education. And these issues around internet freedom have really moved from a kind of esoteric arcane policy issue to one of paramount importance to uh, billions of people around the world. Um, and because also the global free flow of data is necessary to enable the digital economy to flourish and to spur innovation, increase trade, and, and generate higher paying jobs over the next decade, this is also an area of very important focus. So I'd like to begin um, by talking about kind of where we are today in the digital economy. I think we've seen a, a number of waves of digital innovation over the past few decades. You can kind of think about um, this really starting in, in the mainframe economy where you had companies like IBM that created some of the first 
large supercomputers at the time, and, and they really enabled businesses to uh, manage and process information in ways that they never could before. And the companies that were very successful in this era were those that could take advantage of this new technology, the, the mainframes, and, and harness information in ways that their competitors often couldn't. And then if you fast forward a few decades, we moved into the network economy. This is when the personal computer, local area networks, and, and other similar technology uh, came to the forefront. You had new companies like Microsoft and Lotus take off. And it really was the first time that you could put computers at the fingertips of everyday workers. And, and this changed things like word processing um, and really reshuffled many areas of the economy. Um, you go forward another decade or two and you, you hit the internet economy, which we're still in today. Um, and the early days of this were kind of the web 1.0 businesses, uh, the rise of all the dot coms, um, the start of a lot of e-commerce. And we've started to move out of that and we're seeing new ways of innovation, uh, principally around the data economy where you have technologies like social, mobile, and analytics, and cloud driving change in businesses around the world. And what I think we're starting to uh, move into is what we could call the algorithmic economy, where it's about technologies that enable innovation that are giving companies their edge, technologies like artificial intelligence, the internet of things, and blockchain. And so I think all of this is really important uh, to understand because when we think about where we're going, in terms of internet freedom and the economy, um, a few things become clear. One, global connectivity is of paramount importance. Um, you know, the data economy, the algorithmic economy, and the internet economy all depend on uh, all of these devices and, and people being connected. And so we're doing a lot to, I think, increase connectivity around the world, whether you're talking about, uh, you know, more of these, uh, you know, undersea cables, um, some of the, the new advances we're seeing in, in mobile and 5G um, or other changes that we're seeing in this space. We're also seeing an increase in, in terms of cross-border data flows. So all of this data that's being collected is not staying in just one place. The data is, is flowing globally and it's that movement of data that is creating a significant amount of data uh, of value. Indeed, we saw that in, in 2017, cross-border data flows had grown 148 times larger than they had been uh, in 2005. And so this brings me to the, the central point that I want to be talking about during this presentation, which is this question of internet freedom, uh, what it is and, and why it creates economic value. So internet freedom, you know, at its basic definition is just the freedom to, to connect, to speak, to innovate and share content online without restriction. And this freedom depends on the number of, of technical and business factors. So at the technical level, you can think of you know, some of the open standards that exist that have really allowed the internet to be created and, and create significant amount of value. So things like open protocols, uh, TCP IP, um, things like you know, uniform um, uh, domain names and IPv6. Uh, you also have um, you know, other areas, um, some of the business factors and political factors. I wanna get into that uh, in a moment. Um, but I think what's important when we talk about internet freedom, internet freedom is very different than this idea of internet exceptionalism. Uh, internet exceptionalism is the belief that the internet is so unique that traditional rules should no longer apply. Um, and you know, I think at some of the early days of the internet, you had some of these early visionaries saying things like, you know, the internet was gonna be this new virtual space ungoverned by traditional governments. And what we see is that's really not the case. Um, you know, every nation has rules that affect the internet, that affect the businesses that use the internet, and that affect the people that use the internet. Um, there's nothing, uh, there's nothing wrong with that. There's no problem there, um, and that's not what internet freedom is about. Internet freedom isn't this idea that the internet is a lawless place. Internet freedom, again, is really about this idea that people enjoy the freedoms that they enjoy in the offline world, online. So you still have those freedoms to connect, speak, innovate, and share content, just like you do in the real world. Internet freedom is also sometimes confused with net neutrality, this idea that all content must be treated the same on networks. Um, net neutrality is, of course, uh, you know, an important uh, value that has you know, some, uh, some important use when you're talking about how you want to treat content online. But again, it's very different than this broader sense of not just how packets are carried on, on different ISPs, but really about the freedoms that people have on the internet. So when we talk about internet freedom, 
Um, there's a number of areas where internet freedom creates value. And, and this is really what I want to focus on for the most part. So I think there's, there's five main areas. Um, the first is around GDP, uh, just in terms of gross domestic product, the, the kind of pure economic value. We've seen a number of studies uh, in this space uh, indicating that you know, internet connectivity and internet freedom really contributes a lot to a nation's economy. Uh, in 2007, the US digital economy accounted for about 7% or nearly 1.4 trillion for the United States' uh, GDP. And the US digital economy has also had an outsized influence on the growth of the economy as a whole. For example, in, in 2017, uh, the US digital economy accounted for about 25% or a quarter um, of the 2.2% growth in, in real GDP in the United States. Studies have also regularly found that uh, increasing internet access or increasing internet usage correlates strongly with increases in GDP. So for example, there was a study out of the World Bank that found that a 10% increase in fixed broadband correlated with a 1.35% increase uh, in per capita GDP in developing countries. Uh, there was another study that found that a 10% increase in the number of internet subscribers in India led to a 2.4% increase uh, in uh, per capita GDP. So we see a lot of clear evidence just at the macro level that internet connectivity and this internet uh, freedom creates value. We also see this in terms of trade. So by connecting buyers and sellers, the internet creates global value chains and reduces transaction costs. Uh, in, in 2018, the United States exported over $71 billion in ICT services. And of those exports, $38 billion uh, were for IP uh, intellectual property in computer software. The United States also exported another $380 billion in, in services um, that were you know, related to ICT-enabled uh, products and services, such as uh, you know, financial services or insurance services. And we see this outside the United States, of course, too. The internet has clearly been a fit trade in a number of nations. There's a, a 2004 study that found that increases in internet penetration in, in developing countries correlated with increases in exports um, to developed countries. There's a two, 2015 study that found that of 57 nations um, comprising the Organization of Islamic Cooperation, there was a, a positive correlation um, between a nation's internet usage and its international trade and services. And you can see this very clearly when you go online. I mean, if you look at um, eBay, for example, there was a, a 2013 study that found that 95% of uh, eBay's commercial sellers uh, were exporting their products. On average, these sellers were sending products to between 24 and 39 international markets. And that's a huge difference when you compare it to the, the average seller um, you know, outside of outside of e-commerce, outside of this. For, so, for example, when they did a comparison with the average seller in South Africa, they were only exporting to about five international markets. So, a significant increase in access. The third area where we see massive economic value and, and results is around productivity. Um, you know, several studies have found a link between increased productivity and the internet across um, a range of sectors. Um, you know, the, the level of productivity increase is contingent on a number of factors, such as, you know, the firm's business model, the number of employees and, and their skills. Um, but to give a couple of examples here, there was a, a 2005 study um, out of the UK's Office for National Statistics that found multi-factor productivity increased by about 3%, it was 2.9%, uh, for every additional 10% of employees using internet-enabled computers, uh, compared with a 2.2% increase in productivity uh, for just computers with ac employees with access to computers. Uh, so significantly higher when these employees had uh, internet connected computers. Similarly, you saw productivity in services, uh, service firms uh, increase, um, again, depending on the, the percentage of employees using the internet. There was a, a 2009 analysis by representatives from uh, 13 EU statistical offices that found a positive statistical relationship between labor productivity and employees having access to fast internet in the manufacturing sector. Um, and then finally, there was a, a 2009 um, Booz Allen and Company analysis that found that 10% higher broadband penetration correlated with a 1.5% greater growth in labor productivity over a, a five-year period. The fourth area where we see this uh, economic benefit is around employment. Um, 
we've seen that just a number of studies that have found a, a positive correlation between broadband penetration and employment. We've also seen a number that have directly measured the number of jobs the internet supports. So for example, in, in 2009, uh, 19, uh, the Bureau of Economic Analysis conducted uh, a study concerning the digital economy. And it found that the US digital economy had employed 5.1 million workers uh, in 2017, about 3.3% of, of total employment. The digital um, you know, economy employees on average earned uh, significantly more in annual compensation and salary compared to those outside of it. It was um, almost more than double. Between 2011 and 2016, uh, digital economy employment grew at an average rate of 3.7% annually, outpacing the employment growth in, overall, in the overall economy, which grew by about 1.7%. So again, you know, the key takeaway here is that you know, the internet freedom um, model drives the number of jobs, it drives high wage jobs, um, and it drives the overall economic growth and outpaces other parts of the economy. And you know, finally, one of the, the core reasons, of course, for this is that uh, internet freedom is what is driving uh, innovation, and innovation is what leads to um, significant amounts of economic growth. Um, and you know, this is one of the hardest parts to measure, but you know, you can see it in, in various ways. I mean, for one, you know, the open internet itself provides access to a number of self-learning opportunities, like YouTube. It provides access to uh, funds and new markets. And it provides you know, greater spread of ideas through reduced communication costs and, and more types of collaboration. Then you see things like open technical standards that are part of uh, internet freedom that also you know, reduce the barriers to innovation. And they allow someone, for example, creating an internet app um, to not have to create their own network, to not have to build their own um, you know, app ecosystem. And they can just build on top of what's already there, whether it's for payments or, or ads. Um, there was analysis also in the UK that found a significant link between high-speed internet connections and an employee's ability to use ideas from outside a firm to innovate. So, you know, just looking at all of this, you see the, the many different areas where internet freedom is, is leading to economic value. Um, but of course, what we're seeing is around the world, even though there's all this value, there's some ways that, you know, there are different policies being put in place that undercut some of this internet freedom and, and lead to cost. Um, imposed on the economy. And so I want to talk about some of that as well and then move on to how countries can respond to these types of issues. So if you think about the different types of, of threats to internet freedom, um, there's kind of three areas. So one is the, the technical threats. Um, so you know, not using open standards, um, having uh, you know, cybersecurity weaknesses, um, all of these can, can lead to technical threats that actually undercut the ability of, of firms and, and individuals to, to use the internet. Um, the second area is where you see some you know, commercial policies or practices that can limit um, internet freedom. And, and the clearest example of this that we see around the world is typically around um, voice over IP blocking. So historically, there's been a number of telecommunication companies, um, some that are uh, operated by the government, some that are operated by the private sector, uh, that find themselves in competition with um, voice over IP providers, you know, like Skype or, or other services, um, because of the fact that you know these uh, over the internet uh, telecom companies, uh, telephony providers, are able to compete at a lower rate. Instead of using a specialized network, they're able to use the internet, and so they're able to compete at, at um, rates that uh, traditional. Uh, telephony companies could not compete with. And so you've seen ISPs, for example, ISPs in the United Arab, Arab Emirates um, block services like Skype several times, including as recently as last year. Um, in 2016, there were a number of Moroccan ISPs that blocked access to uh, some of these VoIP applications due to a fear of, of lost revenue. And you've also seen ISPs um, lobbying governments to regulate some of these over-the-top providers uh, in several uh, nations, especially in Africa, we've seen this in, in Kenya, in Nigeria, and in South Africa. And then finally, in addition to some of these commercial threats, we see some government threats, and, and this can come in many different forms. Um, some of it is, is very direct um, with government um, interventions that directly result in internet shutdowns. So you see uh, government orders ordering ISPs to uh, basically cease service for a fixed period of time or block access. Uh, to certain major applications. 
we see data localization policies, and I want to talk about that in a little bit more depth. And then we see um, censorship uh, activities where content is, is required to be pulled down. There was a, a really good study from Access Now um, that tracks internet shutdowns around the world. Uh, this map reflects internet shutdowns in, in 2019. Um, you know, they documented 213 incidents of internet shutdowns around the world um, that resulted in, in, you know, significant loss of access to citizens. Uh, this affected 33 countries, um, which was up from 25 countries in, in 2018. Um, among these incidents and among the countries, India was the most um, egregious offender uh, with 121 cases of uh, blocking the internet, uh, followed by Venezuela with 12, Yemen with 11, and Iraq with eight. And so, you know, we see that these internet uh, shutdowns have a significant cost, which, you know, of course, shouldn't be too surprising, given the fact that, you know, we see internet um, generate so much value. But there have been a number of studies that have looked very specifically at what happens when people lose access to the internet, whether, um, you know, uh, where you see a, a kind of a, a full blocking, as you have with some of these ISPs, or even when you see partial blockages um, or some kind of reduction in access. So, for example, Deloitte estimated that um, an internet shutdown um, would cost well-connected nations nearly $24 million for every 10 million inhabitants per day that lose access. Um, Brookings Institute looked at 81 internet shutdowns uh, and major internet application blockages between uh, July 2015 and, and June 30th, 2016, so over a one-year period. And they found that these disruptions cost about $2.4 billion in GDP globally. Um, there was a study that looked at some of the mobile and fixed line internet uh, shutdowns in India between 2012 and, and 2017 that found that there were about 16,000 worth of hours um, of disruption and that cost uh, India's economy about $3 billion. There was another study that looked at um, some of the internet shutdowns in, in smaller African nations, finding that 176 days of, of total internet shutdowns cost about eight nations, 218 million. And we're seeing a number of examples that, like this. And, and you know, some of these um, you know, are, are kind of clear economic losses where you just see a, a loss of business or, or higher cost. Um, we're also seeing you know, very specific examples of where you know, businesses have lost contracts because um, these shutdowns or um, some of the changes in policies made it so that they you know, couldn't pay their suppliers, they lost access to some of their clients. As a result, they, they lost contracts and had to fire employees. So very you know, real world tangible results. Oftentimes we, we've seen some kind of um, uh, you know, varied arguments for um, the justifications for these shutdowns. Uh, so for example, you know, in, in some countries we saw an argument that um, the shutdowns were necessary to reduce cheating on uh, college exams or, or high school exams. So in 2016, for example, Algeria blocked access to Facebook and Twitter to stop students from cheating on high school exams. Um, and they were trying to keep, they said the government was trying to keep uh, students from accessing uh, phony exam question topics that some people had posted online. Um, the government did this again in, in 2018, ordering telecom operators to shut down access to the internet for three hours a day um, during a week of national high school exams. Again, there was a study that, that looked at this and, and Brookings estimated that the decision to block access to some of these sites um, cost uh, Algeria about um, $20 million in GDP in, in 2016. Um, and then it cost between six to $7 million in 2018 uh, because of the fact that they, they did it again, but it was just a uh, less, fewer number of hours. Um, Another reason that we've seen for blocking internet access is to limit protest. Um, Iraq, for example, shut down access to the internet for roughly 75% of individuals in the country uh, during some anti-corruption protests uh, last year. We've seen India shut down um, you know, mobile internet services in 2016 in order to stop the spread of rumors about protest. Um, in that case, Brookings estimated that the shutdown cost India about 190 million uh, in GDP. So significant um, blockages, and um, you know, again, sometimes people are making the argument that these uh, shutdowns are um, are worth it because of what they're trying to achieve. But what's interesting is what we also see is that whenever there's government attempts at 
at blocking access to applications, users quickly move to alternatives to try and circumvent them. So I have a, up here a, a graph of um, a VPN service um, that was that's you know commonly used. Um, this one's called Pango VPN, and we got some data from them um, for uh, two instances where a country made a major um, blocking order. So in 2019, India uh, banned TikTok, um, and you know the court ruled that you know TikTok could expose minors to content that was problematic. And so they ordered the major app stores, Google and Apple, to remove TikTok uh, from their services. What we saw is this huge increase um, in the downloads of VPN, uh, this VPN tool, uh, as soon as this order goes into effect. And the reason we saw this is because when people download these types of tools, they can then use this tool to circumvent um, application bans. We saw this also in, in Sri Lanka, um, where there was a similar ban on social media networks, Facebook, WhatsApp, and Instagram for nine days in order to start, stop the spread of uh, misinformation. And over the first four days of this ban, again, we saw this tripling of downloads of these types of services. So, you know, again, the, the point here is that um, many times the, you know, the, these orders to block access to certain types of services on the internet um, are ineffective. Um, they are effective, of course, in, you know, creating uh, some blocking, and you know that blocking has a detrimental economic effect. Um, but usually, if they're trying to stop a particular um, activity, especially you know a, a kind of maybe a questionable activity or, or one that people are highly motivated to pursue, um, like getting access to social media, we see that people are quickly circumventing that with other tools. So you know the, the goal of this um, blocking isn't actually uh, very very justified. So now I want to talk about data localization. Um, so one of the you know kind of alternatives uh, policies that we've seen around the world is um, increasingly companies are, are, are countries are, are pursuing data localization policies, and so data localization policies um, can can take various forms. Um, you know these policies are basically uh, saying that data must stay within a country um, either completely. So for example, um, certain type of uh, business information must, there might be a requirement that it be stored or processed locally, um, or there could be a requirement that a copy of the data must stay locally. Um, and we see this being applied to um, various types of information, government information, accounting, um, personal information. There's uh, different types of data that this might be applied to. Um, but we're seeing that this also has a, a very negative effect on the economy. There's a 2005 study, a 2015 study, excuse me, um, by the information security firm Leviathan that found that data localization policies uh, would force local firms in many nations to pay between 30 to 60% more for their computing needs. And, you know, we've seen this um, in another study uh, as well that it found that there was likely to see uh, that, that countries that had data localization policies or you had restrictive data regulations um, were likely to lead to an increase in prices or decreased productivity. Uh, in the countries they looked at, Brazil, China, um, the EU, India, Indonesia, Russia, South Korea, and Vietnam. Um, and you know, one of the reasons this is such a problem is because data localization policies make it very difficult uh, for businesses to sell their services and products globally because of the high cost of implementing separate services for each nation that they have to store their data in. So if you think about you know, a, a kind of a typical firm that's trying to operate in um, even a handful of nations, they might have supplier data coming from um, a dozen uh, countries. They might have uh, employees in a few different firms. They're going to be receiving customers uh, and customer payment information from different countries. And if they have to store this data separately in, in each country in which they're doing business, it makes it very difficult for them to build a, a scalable operation. And in particular, if you think back to that first slide that I started with in this conversation about how we're moving from um, you know, the, the mainframe economy to the network economy, uh, to the internet economy, to the uh, data economy, and then the algorithmic economy. You know, as we're moving from the data economy to the algorithmic economy, this connectivity, this ability to process data um, is hugely important. And you're seeing, you know, again, companies being very successful based on how they apply data analytics. And you can't do that if you can't actually pull all your data together in one place. And you can't do that if you can't make use of the best in class analytics services which might require you to send your data to another country. 
And so when we see these data localization policies, they're, they're really problematic for how um, you know, companies in, in different countries can be leading firms in this emerging data economy. Um, as, I, as I noted, we're seeing this type of um, policy you know, really emerge in, in countries um, around the world. Um, and it's something that I think we're starting to think about how we can address in, in some of our trade agreements. Um, in general, you know, we're seeing countries take two different approaches to digital transformation. Um, one approach is you know, the, the precautionary principle, and that's when they see a new digital technology um, and they say, you know what, the precautionary principle uh, approach is that government should limit the use of, of new technology until it's proven safe. This is the idea that it's better to be safe than sorry. And so sometimes we see a, a new technology being introduced and then you see government ban it, um, at least temporarily. So you see this with things like ride sharing or e-scooters, um, sometimes even the internet. Um, in contrast, you see some countries look at digital transformation and, and embrace the innovation principle. The innovation principle says that the vast majority of new innovations are beneficial and pose little risk. So the government's role is to encourage them. And the point here isn't that you know, the market's always gonna get things right. It doesn't mean that the government should never intervene, but instead it's the government should take a, a general wait and see approach. They should wait and see how can markets and platforms and consumers respond to different problems that arise. And also what are the potential unintended consequences of regulatory solutions? Um, and are there alternatives to regulatory interventions? So for example, um, can government work hand in hand with the private sector to address uh, specific problems? Then we also see two different policy approaches to digital trade. Um, one is a protectionist approach, which says, you know, um, we should really, really be focusing on, on boosting domestic firms. Uh, so let's restrict foreign service providers from processing domestic data. And that's giving rise to a lot of these data localization policies. And the alternative view is the free trade view which is to focus on minimizing barriers to trade. So here, the goal is how do we allow foreign service providers to have access to the market for data processing? And so when you put these two different approaches together, uh, the two different ways of looking at digital transformation, and then the two different ways that digital, looking at digital trade, um, you see a number of different policies emerge around, um, around how to think about data. Um, so you know, on the kind of protectionist side, you see this isolationist view sometimes, the data should be tightly controlled and, and stored locally. That's kind of what you see in countries like Brazil. In others, you see a very nationalistic type of view. So data should be stored locally to protect some type of uh, security, privacy, or economic interest. And that's, for example, what China is doing. Um, if you look on the, the free trade side, um, then you have the kind of interventionist side, which would be something like the EU, where the argument is that, you know, unless countries adopt, you know, our data rules, um, the data should be stored locally. So they're kind of pro-trade, uh, but only if other countries adopt their rules. And then you have the innovationist uh, view, which is, I think is reflected in, in Japan and the United States, which is that you know, data should be able to flow globally. Um, and we wanna see uh, you know, different, different uses um, made of, of data around the world. So um, let me more or less stop there. I just wanna conclude by talking about you know, how countries should respond to you know, this, this goal of internet freedom while also recognizing, of course, that there are sometimes very legitimate reasons that some of these types of policies are pursued. Um, so the first principle here is that we should enable the free flow of data. Um, so, you know, again, the, the point here is really that when you look at how innovation is occurring in this space, um, so much innovation is being driven by access to data, data analytics, machine learning, and, and artificial intelligence. And so the goal of policy should be to make sure that businesses have access to high quality data and they have access to high quality analytic services. And the only way to do that is to enable the free flow of data, just like countries support free trade in other areas. Um, the second principle here is avoiding internet shutdowns. As we've seen, you know, there's clear economic consequences um, to internet shutdowns, to reductions in internet access. And there is rarely a case or pretty much never a case where a pure internet shutdown is the right solution. Um, it's also important to avoid blocking legitimate apps and sites. Um, we have seen instances, of course, where there's certain content that should be pulled down. And you know, the, the best way to approach that is by working through legal means with various companies that are um, the platforms hosting this content to submit a lawful request to take down content, um, encourage transparency in these types of processes, and hold companies accountable for complying with that. Um, but we should never have wholesale blocking of some of these legitimate apps and sites 
Instead, we should have reasonable conversations about specific content that should be taken down and making sure that those takedowns only occur within one jurisdiction. It's, it's very important that you know, countries recognize the fact that we are in this globally networked economy and it, it can't be that one country dictates the internet policies for all the other countries. These are all sovereign nations. Um, it's important that internet policies and, and uh, practices don't spill over and negatively affect um, other uh, sovereign nations' rights as well. And so the best way to do that is, is through, um, you know, for example, if there's a takedown request for specific content, that that takedown request only apply in a specific country instead of applying globally. Uh, the fourth principle is, is seeking to balance data protection regulations with, you know, the goal of innovation. Um, what we've seen with some of the data protection regulations is that they become so extreme, they result in data localization or they result in, um, you know, trying to force other countries to follow their data protection rules. And again, um, you know, the goal should be to work in a, a harmonized and interoperable way with other countries rather than trying to set the rules of the road for everyone. And finally, I think one of the most important policies here is that, um, you know, again, the, the point of internet freedom is not internet exceptionalism. It's not that we don't need um, laws and regulation in this space. In fact, I think there's many areas where countries should be working together to, um, you know, really address some key concerns about um, problematic activity online. And we've seen some cooperation in areas like this before, for example, in, in things like uh, spam, there's been global cooperation on addressing this threat. Um, but there's also areas like um, you know, digital piracy, where I think more cooperation is needed, um, as well as going after other types of cybercrime, whether it's um, online hacking and, and misinformation, um, to some of the you know, various intermediaries that allow cybercrime to flourish, like bulletproof hosting providers. Um, so, you know, I'll, I'll stop there, but I'll just conclude by saying, um, you know, I think there's a, some really great opportunities for countries that have, you know, uh, long been, you know, committed partners to uh, some of the, you know, democratic uh, values and freedoms we all cherish to get behind internet freedom as well and, and you know, helping leading voices around the world and, and pushing for the importance of these changes um, and these principles as other countries work together on um, ensuring uh, the internet remains a place where, you know, people do have that freedom to uh, create and innovate um, and share ideas uh, with freedom. So let me stop there and, and just uh, thank again our, our um, uh, host for inviting me to be part of this conversation today. Great, Daniel, thank you so much. Um, so I just wanted to kind of start off one thing that uh, I noticed in your, your presentation was um, I think it was on the blocking global flow of data slide and it showed a number of countries um, that seemed a bit counterintuitive to have passed some kind of uh, legislation or something to block some kind of data, you know, the US, Canada, UK. Um, and so, I, you know, while it seems counterintuitive, um, it also appears that maybe some countries have found a way to do this in a responsible way. And I'm curious if you could talk about any lessons learned from, from these experiences or best practices and basically how can governments responsibly regulate data um, without adversely impacting their, their digital economy development? Absolutely, you know, I, I think um, in general, you don't want to see, you know, any, uh, any data blocking. And I think, you know, there's opportunities for, for all countries to learn how to do this better. Um, but, you know, when it does occur, you know, the best way for it to be done in a um, minimally intrusive way is to uh, limit it you know, very, uh, you know, very closely to very small amounts of data. So for example, um, you know, uh, it might be reasonable for a country to say, um, you know, certain national security data needs to be stored, um, you know, on a uh, server within our borders, um, because we believe we can provide, you know, uh, you know, physical security to that data center in a way that if it's abroad, it might not have that same physical security. That's a very, you know, reasonable approach in, in terms of ensuring uh, redundancy, you know, ensuring that if there's a natural disaster, for example, um, you know, that it would affect, you know, connectivity um, outside your country, that you still have access to certain uh, critical information. Um, what I think is problematic is when you see this applied to things like, um, you know, personal data, for example, just broadly personal data um, that's being collected uh, for commercial uses. I think it's uh, very problematic when you see this applied to things like uh, payment data or financial data that that, you know, again, just naturally is going to be um, flowing globally because of the way commerce occurs. And so I think, you know, in any of these cases, 
you have to ask, you know, what's the goal of this regulation, you know, and, and can this goal be satisfied in, in other ways? For example, um, you know, even if data is stored abroad, as long as the data is stored by a company that is based domestically, governments still have access to that information. They simply come in uh, with a warrant and you know require those companies to disclose this information. And it doesn't matter if that company has the data stored abroad or not; they're still able to get access to that information. So I think that's where you know these um, this balance has to be struck, and you know that's how you can enable firms to innovate in this space and, and protect certain goals the governments reasonably have while not imposing undue cost on, on firms or the economy. Okay, great. Thanks a lot. Um, so uh, one question was, you know, there's actually two questions kind of to the same topic. Um, so there's a dearth of locally relevant studies and to make matters worse, a lack of evidence-based and risk-based approach towards legislation in Pakistan. Uh, are there any plans for AIPS or ITF or even the U.S. Embassy to support and partner on more locally relevant studies in Pakistan in this area? Yeah, I mean, I would you know love to do more work in this area, and um, you know we do have um, as part of ITIF we have this Global Trade and Innovation Policy Alliance where we work with think tanks around the world um, to try and you know. Uh, specifically do this, you know, one, share lessons learned from, from different countries, but to um, get locally produced evidence and, and facts on the ground to better understand um, the impact of different policies um, on innovation um, around the world. Uh, so, you know, certainly open to this. I, I do think, though, that when we're talking about some of these, you know, internet policy issues, yes, it's, it's true that local, you know, local evidence is important. Um, but we're all using the same platforms in the globally connected economy. So we, we can look at almost any country and see the impact that it has there and, you know, make the, understand the parallels and the relevance that it has to um, our own countries because, you know, again, we're, we're just using the same platform. So if, you know, eBay changes its policies or, or goes down, um, you know, that affects, you know, um, sellers in Colombia as much as it affects uh, sellers in, in Costa Rica or the United States. Um, and, you know, around the world. So I think that's where, you know, we just have to recognize that, you know, in this new globalized environment, uh, you know, we can, we can see the impact. Um, and that's where, you know, I think some of these local policies are, are really important, though, for understanding how, you know, how small changes at the local level can have a big impact. So, for example, you know, some of the reasons that um, certain countries don't perform as well on some of these innovation metrics is not because they don't have the connectivity, but because you know there's some other barrier that's that's in the way that's you know holding them back, and sometimes it is something as you know as kind of uh, uh, seemingly strange as a data localization policy that people aren't really thinking about, but it actually is raising the cost by you know 20 or 30 percent on local businesses, and that's the reason that you're seeing that these firms are less competitive with their global peers. Okay, great, and and maybe just to follow up on that. Um, in your experiences engaging with other countries, what have you found to be maybe the most impactful, um, you know, top, top couple of uh, areas of say like your presentation that would um, speak most strongly to a country that's seeking to grow its digital economy? Yeah, so I mean, I think one of the most important things is that, um, you know, the, the countries that do best are the ones that are working closely with um, the private sector and understanding the impact that their policies have. So, for example, you know what we're not seeing, you know, the really successful countries doing is, um, you know, for example, uh, coming in with a data protection law um, or you know a, a call to block um, online content without working very closely with you know the different partners that are affected by it. Because all countries are trying to deal with these issues. I mean, all countries right now are working on data protection bills. They're working on content regulation. They're they're thinking about how do we you know, deal with all these questions that, you know, all countries are dealing with, which is protecting data and, and making the online environment um, safe and um, and preventing the spread of misinformation, hate speech, other types of uh, problematic content. And, you know, the way they're doing that, though, is, is they're, you know, recognizing that, first of all, um, there's no simple solutions in this space. It, it's not a matter of um, you know, there's the one right perfect solution and we just have to pass that law. It's no, it's really how are you working in partnership with different stakeholders that include the private sector and includes, you know, nonprofit um, and, and the civil society sector as well, because often you're seeing civil society step up with things like fact checking or, um, you know, working to increase digital literacy. Um, 
but beyond that, you know, it's it's also working on on making sure that um, you're not creating these localization requirements. You're not requiring data to be stored locally. You're not requiring businesses to open up um, local offices. You know, just kind of raise costs in ways that make it so that companies want to exit the market. Because even though we're talking about sometimes very large platforms, they still have to figure out, you know, where does it make sense for them to do business? Um, where is there a good ROI in their investment? Because there's lots of places they want to be. And, you know, the companies that are, you know, getting more of that investment are the ones that are um, really able to work hand in hand uh, with the private sector to address these problems, but also create the right kind of regulatory framework that encourages innovation, that encourages, encourages domestic innovation in the space. And, you know, that's where I think, um, you know, just, you know, the, the countries that are most successful are, are really looking at those types of issues. Okay, great, thank you. Um, so the next question we had, um, I know you're not an expert on Pakistan specific, but um, I know we've talked a little bit about it previously. Could you talk a little bit about the data localization um, and also the other, uh, you know, removal and online blocking of unlawful online content? Um, in, in the context of Pakistan and kind of what, what's your view of that? Yeah, I mean, so uh, first of all, I think, you know, one thing that I, I didn't mention that's important to mention here is, um, you know, we want to make sure in, in every country, part of internet freedom is the ability to communicate and that includes communicating privately. Um, so one concern is that, you know, um, you don't have any countries putting in place policies that restrict uh, encryption. And so, you know, I think that's something that um, you know, we want to make sure that, you know, uh, you know, I think, um, you know, countries need to be careful that as you're moving forward with data protection bills or, you know, um, any type of citizen protection online, um, that they're not restricting uh, access to encryption, because that's one of the best ways to preserve privacy. It's one of the best ways to uh, preserve, um, you know, also that commercial uh, security. Um, the second is you don't want to raise costs by having data localization requirements that force data to be stored locally. I think that is just one of the biggest problems. That's something that I think, you know, in, in Pakistan in particular, um, you want to avoid for two reasons. One is that, um, again, you know, you want to get, have access to best in class services. Um, two, you don't want to, you know, kind of create this uh, domino effect where, you know, some people, some countries might say, well, if we create a data localization policy, that's good for us. It, it encourages people to build more data centers here. Um, that creates jobs and that's a win. But the problem is, you know, if all countries think that way, um, that just raises costs for everyone and, and everyone ends up a loser. It's kind of a, a classic prisoner's dilemma type situation, um, which is why it's so important. I mean, this is really a trade issue that you know we have to have countries commit to uh, not engage in data localization policies because it, it just ends up being a drag in the economy. It, it makes everyone else end up, everyone end up being a loser in the, in the long term. Um, and you know, the, the third is around you know, this kind of the regulation of, of um, content online. You know, this is where it's it's really important that um, we don't put in place rules that um, you know put unreasonable requirements on on taking down content, um, especially ones that could be uh, enforced um, you know uh, globally um, that you know don't uh, align with the the kind of global norms around uh, free speech. Um, and again, recognizing that every country looks at these issues differently. Um, but there still has to be a balance here. And, and that's where, you know, it's really important that countries um, remain focused on, um, you know, asking this question about, you know, what's kind of most important? Do they want to be part of the globally connected economy? Um, or do they just want to kind of shut off access? And, um, you know, if you, if you want to be part of the globally connected economy, you have to find a way to, um, again, be interoperable, which means it's not that you have to have the same rules as everyone else, but you can't, you know, block content, you can't uh, have these kind of draconian rules that um, make it so businesses aren't willing to uh, engage. Okay, great, thanks. Um, so the next question is, uh, how do we approach the issue of the value of internet freedom in a country where there's limited understanding or appreciation on the value of press freedom? Are there any case studies in other parts of the world where internet freedom has helped economies understand the value of press freedom? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, I mean, we've certainly seen, uh, you know, um, in some countries that uh, internet access, internet, um, you know, uh, especially access to certain types of services had its increased um, access to, to news and information. It certainly increased the diversity of news stories. It's increased the uh, types of voices that get out there. Um, of course, we've also seen over the last, um, you know, couple of years that we've seen people, you know, kind of try and weaponize this, um, 
freedom by uh, creating disinformation online and, and misinformation online. Um, and so, you know, right now, I think as internet access grows and internet freedom grows, there is this really valuable partnership that can exist and should exist between, um, you know, the, the free press and, uh, you know, uh, different internet stakeholders. And that's why I think so many of the, the main, you know, large internet players um, do have a strong, you know, connection to the press. I mean, you see everything from, you know, Google News to, you know, Facebook working with different uh, media partners um, to, you know, things like uh, even YouTube, um, where, you know, different types of sources are, are vetted um, or prioritized. But, you know, even there, um, I think a lot of this comes back to digital literacy and media literacy and, and the importance of having, you know, good, um, you know, civil society programs that promote that. Um, because, you know, these, these values don't exist uh, in a vacuum. Um, they don't, you know, uh, kind of prosper without, um, without support. And so, you know, it, it's, you know, I think we see these, these values can be very fragile. I don't know if we've seen a specific case study where, um, you know, again, I don't think it's, it's causal, um, but we have seen, you know, in, in various parts of the world, as the internet creates more freedom, um, in terms of the ability to communicate, share ideas, organize politically, um, you know, combat misinformation, combat hate speech, you do have a more engaged uh, civil society, and that is good for um, you know freedom and democracy. Okay, great. Um, kind of following up on the earlier question, are there any plans for ITIF or AIPS to engage with the Pakistan Telecommunication Authority and or the Ministry of uh, Information Technology and Telecommunication more directly? Uh, they said you have shown some solid evidence and research here that they would benefit from. Um, I don't have anything uh, specific to announce right now. I don't know if AIPS does um, separately, but on the ITIF side, as I said, we're right now kind of working with some partners. We do also put out um, uh, a number of metrices um, indexes where we look at global innovation, and, and some of those have include, included Pakistan in the past, and you know we continue to engage in that space. Um, and you know, because I, th I think that. Uh, also is a, a key part of this. You can't, I mean, uh, a lot of my work looks at digital innovation and internet policy. Um, I think Tink as a whole looks at innovation um, generally. And, you know, we, we do see that there's of course a, a strong correlation between countries that are embracing um, innovation policies over their entire economy with those that are also looking at it in the digital economy. And ideally those are going hand in hand where for example, a, a country that's, you know, um, has a, you know, important agricultural sector or manufacturing sector, um, textile sector. I mean, they're um, looking at the digital economy as, as a key part of that. And so these are going you know, hand in hand together. Okay, great. And, and just to the, uh, to the person asking the question, there is also a, a program that uh, the embassy uh, works with the Department of Commerce on. It's called the Commercial Law Development Program. Um, and there is an opportunity there for U.S. Embassy and kind of U.S. government more broadly to engage with the government um, so we'll be happy to work with ITIF or anyone else who's uh, interested in contributing to research and um, working to get that to uh, lawmakers and other government officials to, to consider. So, um, so on uh, the next question, uh, many governments have used the U.S. Clean Network Initiative in the U.S. to justify blocking of services from certain countries, uh, which is clearly terrible for data flows. What's the ITIF view on this? Yeah, so um, I mean, the the kind of clean networks proposal is obviously still somewhat new. Um, I've actually written a piece on this that, you know, if there's a way to make it available to the group, um, I'm happy to share. It's available on our website, itif.org, where we go through some of the specific policies in there. And, um, you know, I, I think some of them are, are useful and some of them are um, maybe less useful. I mean, certainly it's reasonable that um, you know, for example, embassies around the world um, of any country um, and consulates want to be able to connect securely and, you know, think about um, the ways in which they can be sure that um, adversaries can't intercept their networks. And we've seen in the last 24 hours news coming out about some of the Russian attacks on, you know, U.S. government networks. Um, so we know these are real threats. We know these are serious and we have to take these threats seriously, um, especially when they're state-sponsored attacks. Um, we also know that um, you know, there are, um, you know, what we shouldn't have is policies come into place that uh, restrict uh, competition 
by saying that you know the country of origin of a particular company is, is problematic. I don't think that you know it's like these data localization policies. At the end, that's a, a losing proposition for everyone because that means we can no longer trade globally. Um, you know, for some time, people were suspicious about U.S. companies because of concerns they might be tied too closely to U.S. government. I think a lot of U.S. companies have taken extraordinary steps to increase their transparency and accountability to make it clear to their um, stakeholders and, and partners around the world um, that they, you know, that they are, they can be trusted, um, that they're not secretly sharing information with the government. I think that's the kind of commitments we need from um, any firms that are trying to operate in, in this global economy. Um, we need to make sure that they're not a front for any government. Um, and there are steps they can do to take that. Some of that's, you know, things like allowing third party auditors of their source code, allowing third party testing. Um, and some of it is, is brand and reputation. And then some of it is by having a, a global trade environment where, you know, we, we, you know, collectively kind of punish any companies that try to, de you know, deceive, um, you know, their, uh, their clients globally. And so, you know, on, on the Clean Networks Initiative, um, again, I mean, I think some of those policies are kind of uh, appropriate and useful, you know, when you're talking about protecting national security. Um, I think some of the other policies maybe go too far. And this is where we really want to have a, um, you know, a, a careful look to make sure that we're not um, pursuing policies that disrupt the global free flow of data, which is critical. Okay, great, thanks. Um, so the next question that uh, has been submitted, um, it's important to have local studies and research, not just for ministries, but also for parliamentary committees and strategic litigations. Any, any leads on how to partner with ITIF on producing such a study in Pakistan? Um, well, uh, my email's up, so feel free to shoot me an email. I'm happy to talk further. Um, I, you know, I, I think it's true. I mean, you know, one of the, the biggest issues, I mean, that we've seen in, in some countries is that, you know, it's, it's a lack of understanding. In particular, um, in addition to legislators, it's often, you know, in the judiciary where you see a judicial order come forward, um, you know, limiting access to an entire website uh, or service, an app, ordering a takedown, um, or even blocking, you know, the internet as a whole. Um, because there's a poor understanding of, of the economic consequences. So, I mean, I, I certainly, you know, from that perspective, I agree that, you know, local evidence is, is really useful. Um, I'd also say, you know, there are some, some of these studies that I cited, in particular, the, um, the Brookings study and um, I'm trying to think which was the other one. I think maybe it was the Deloitte study. Um, these are open formulas um, that are that are in these studies about how to calculate the economic cost of shutdowns. And so the formulas can be localized to particular environments. So there's definitely, a, um, you know, there's, there's feasibility there to produce, you know, some local evidence about what the clear, uh, clear impact is of, you know, uh, you know, various restrictions on internet freedom. Okay. Um, so the next question was, is there any online platform available to monitor government's efforts to promote and ensure internet freedom? Um, so there's a few studies. There's, you know, the Access Now study that I referenced. There's also the Freedom House study. Um, the Freedom House organization puts out an annual internet freedom study. Uh, that one, you know, I, I have some uh, problems with the methodology, but you can see all their data. So you can, you know, kind of use your own judgment about um, the takeaways from that. But there's certainly, you know, some efforts in that case to, to track this. Um, part of the problem, of course, is that this is a very fast moving area. Um, I had a a slide that I didn't include here that kind of shows the number of internet or data protection laws that have been passed, um, you know, every year over the past um, two decades. And I mean, we've seen just a huge increase in the past uh, five years in terms of the number of data protection laws. And we've seen, of course, other content regulation type laws crop up as well. And so it's also very hard to, to track the impact of these laws and then track how they're actually being implemented. Because sometimes there is also a difference between you know, the, letter, the letter of the law and the actual enforcement. And this is also an opportunity for, I think, countries to you know, think about how their, um, you know, sometimes what they have on the books maybe doesn't match how they actually want to enforce this. And there's opportunities to you know, balance these policies and, and strike a regulatory balance you know, between innovation and um, you know, protectionism or, or something else and how they actually implement these policies so as to minimize any negative harm uh, this would have on the economy. Okay, great. Um, so in the, uh, there have been a number of incidents in, in Pakistan of, uh, you know, in, in other countries as well, for that matter, of people reacting negatively to um, information, whether true or not, that's been posted online. Um, you know, people taking kind of retaliatory measures 
against um, you know certain countries where content may come from. Um, but there, there are other countries that have similar conservative, cultural, social, religious values um, where maybe we don't see as much of this. And I'm curious, you know, what other socially conservative countries would you point to as a good example of developing common sense regulations for monitoring content um, and doing it in a way that sort of protects those sensibilities while also not restricting uh, too much on, on information or data, uh, you know, on online platforms? Sure. I mean, I think what's important here is that, um, I mean, there's there's a few things. One, you know, one of the principles that I think um, is good to, you know, think about in this space is that it's not the the platforms that are, you know, kind of um, should should not be responsible for the speech of the users on their platforms. You know, this is one of the central premises of, um, you know, one of the founding laws for the Internet in the United States, Section Two Thirty of the Communication Decency Act. And you know, the, the point here isn't that platforms don't have um, the means or the ability to take down content, especially illegal content, they, they can and they should. Um, but it just says that you don't treat the platforms as being liable and responsible for the speech of someone else, which is the same principle we um, apply in, in any other uh, space. You know, Individuals are responsible for their own actions and, and they're the ones that should be held responsible for their actions. So what that means is if there's content that a country wants to take down, you know, kind of regardless of the cultural context and, you know, whether it's a, a lot or a little, whether it's a kind of conservative culture or, or more liberal culture, um, or even if it's, you know, related to a, a particular type of content, um, you know, be religious or non-religious, for example, it, the, the point is really, you know, what's the response in that case? The response is that there's some kind of content that is, if it's illegal, then it's illegal in that in that country and it has to be taken down. Um, but then, you know, how is that policy put in place? Is it that, the platform is, is penalized or held to some kind of unreasonable standard of knowing all the content that's on their platform? Or is it simply, you know, if they're notified of this illegal content, then they have a responsibility to take it down in, in line with laws um, that give them, you know, a reasonable amount of time to, to do it, um, to appeal it if there's questions, and to allow the user to seek redress so that there's, um, you know, there's, there's a proper, you know, uh, legal recourse for the users and they're not just having their content taken down without some uh, form of appeals process. As long as you have that kind of system in place, um, then it's less about you know the the specific type of content that's being taken down, and more about do you have a fair set of rules. I think that's what's most important: is do you have a fair set of rules that allows um, you know that allows the platforms to operate in, in many different environments that doesn't force them to abide by um, you know policies that maybe they can't understand or enforce. You have to have still this kind of rule of law, and that gives you know 